many thanks for joining us today. You're watching Business Edge. I'm Esther Awuni. On the show today, we'll unpack South Africa's new visa system, which seeks to attract foreign talent, a move the country says will help it become more competitive. Also on the show today, we'll bring you an update on Nigeria's FX reforms, and we'll also discuss a newly upgraded trade and investment partnership between the UK and Nigeria, aimed at enhancing economic ties between both countries. We'll also check in on the markets for a review of trading at the local boss. But that's what you can expect on the show for today. And now let's kick things off with our top headlines from across the continent. Welcome back on Tuesday evening, Brent. The global crude benchmark climbed to $83.19 a barrel, marking a $1.19 increase on the previous day's price. Following fresh data from the federal government in indicating Nigeria's oil output surged above 1.4 million barrels per day in January this year. This uptick in crude prices, coupled with Nigeria's heightened production, is poised to boost the country's foreign exchange earnings as crude oil sales remain its primary source. According to the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission CEO, Binga Komolafe, during a presentation in Lagos at the Petroleum Technology Association of Nigeria, the Nigeria's crude oil and condensate production rose by 91,476 barrels per day in January compared to December last year, reaching 1.64 million barrels per day. That's up from December's 1.55 million barrels per day. Well, outside our shores, Ghana's finance minister, Kenufuri Atis, is optimistic about the country's economic future. He heightened the highlight of the expected increase in international reserves uh, owing to nearly, due to nearly $2 billion anticipated from development partners. He also mentioned they already received $600 million from the IMF and they approved $300 million from the World Bank. Additional funds are expected from various sources, including an $800 million uh, cocoa loan. Foriata also addressed the country's external debt, expressing a confidence in finalizing all agreements and restructuring about $5.4 billion in bilateral debt. He also emphasized the importance of fiscal discipline, even in an election year, and the need to resume stalled infrastructure projects after debt restructuring. Elsewhere, Kenya has made a calculated decision to pay over 10% on a new international bond in order to avoid a default later in the year. And while double-digit borrowing costs are typically seen as a warning sign, Kenya felt compelled to take this step as it faced the possibility of not being able to cover a $2 billion bond payment due in June this year. By buying back most of, what, of that bond and issuing a new $1.5 billion dollar note that doesn't require repayment until 2029, Kenya managed to avoid default. Although the high price of the bond with an effective interest rate of 10.37% raised concerns, it was seen as a necessary move to overcome the liquidity challenge the country faced. Those are top business headlines at this hour. We'll take a quick break and I'll be right back for a quick market update. Join us again. Welcome back. Uh, due to a 334.6 basis, basis point depreciation and a negative market breadth, the Nigerian stock market ended the day in the red, in contrast to the day before when it gained 0.18% to close the session at over 102,000 points. The OSHA index fell by 0.33% to close the session at over 100,000 points. And uh, the NGX market capitalization showed a narrow loss of 183 uh, billion. Now, let's take a look at the numbers now, starting with the all share uh, index. We have seen the market uh, oscillating between gains and losses. Uh, this time, of, that's from yesterday's session. We're seeing it down 0.33%. Uh, uh, same with the market capitalization. But let's go straight to uh, the top gainers for the session. Uh, let's see uh, those stocks that made it into uh, positive territory. Honeywell, Flour, Julie. Well, now just 
I've been talking about this stock in the last two weeks or so. Uh, it's gone from a penny stock. It's now trading at over one now at uh, gaining 9.9% uh, in yesterday's session. So definitely a stock to uh, keep an eye on. Uh, let's move over to the rest of the gainers for the session. Cornerstone Insurance. Uh, well, let's take a look at the top losers now. PZ, uh, Morrison Computer Warehouse Group, uh, uh, E-Transact, and Sovereign Insurance are all in negative territory. So it's a mix back here uh, for the top losers. Let's take a look at the sector of performance, uh, if we have that, to give you a broader look of how the market uh, performed on the day. Well, if we don't have that, we can just go, well, but there you have it. Uh, so to give you a broader picture of how the market performed for the top uh, indicators that we track here on the show. Banking index still in negative territory, down 1.8%. Insurance sector still standing strong uh, from over 2% uh, gains in the previous session, up over 1%. Oil and gas index uh, still in positive territory, but not uh, seeing significant gains in the last couple of sessions. Consumer goods down about a quarter of a percent. Uh, industrial goods still in negative territory. We're still seeing some profit taken there. Uh, among the top heavyweights uh, in that sector. Well, that's a, a recap of trading. Yesterday, market is open for trading today, open at 10 a.m. We'll be keeping an eye on the numbers. We'll take a quick break now, and we'll be right back with our first conversation. Join us again. Welcome back. The Central Bank of Nigeria this week has sold up to $86 million uh, in the spot market. Uh, and it's its first sale of dollars in the market since uh, September 2023. Well, that's according to Business Day. It's the latest in a series of attempts to uh, stabilize the Naira. The Apex Bank had also previously removed the cap on the spread between buying and selling prices at the interbank foreign exchange market, a move aimed at achieving a market-driven exchange rate system. Meanwhile, the Naira appreciated against the dollar at the official market on Tuesday this week with a notable increase of about 202% in Forex turnover at $271.5 million. So joining me for this conversation is Dikwa Jai, head of Exit FX at Chapel Hill Denim. Dikwa, thank you for taking the time out to join us today. Just wanted you to come, uh, quickly just confirm uh, that uh, story, uh, the CBN selling dollars at the spot market uh, for the first time in, in, in a while. Uh, talk to us about uh, if that is uh, correct and also just how the Naira uh, is faring at the market now. Well, thank you very much, Esther, for having me on this morning. Um, the story is actually true. Uh, the central bank was in the market yesterday uh, selling FX to banks. Uh, um, what we, information we gathered from banks was that um, they sold um, like $5 million worth of FX to uh, some banks and lower than that to some other banks. So I think in totality, um, the central bank sold about $86 million um, to the market yesterday. Uh, and we noticed that Naira appreciated in the uh, NAPM window yesterday. Uh, Naira appreciated by about 35 Naira in the NAPM window to close at about 8,499 uh, levels yesterday. Um, and just like what you actually mentioned in the intro, uh, the central bank has been coming out with different uh, FX framework uh, policy to actually shape in the FX market. Uh, and uh, but we have mentioned several times that um, those policies they are good, those FX frameworks they are wonderful, uh, but it will not yield anything without any supply to the market. And I think uh, what central bank has done is to actually put the market in place. Uh, before now coming in to actually pump in uh, liquidity to the, to the market. So I think if the central bank continuing this set, uh, we'll tell we will likely see uh, now appreciating in uh, both uh, the official market and uh, the parallel markets. Now still on the reforms, uh, before now, the CBN uh, a couple of days ago uh, removed the cap on trading, or the prices rather, at the interbank uh, FX market. Uh, I believe it was about 2 or 2.5%, essentially, uh, trying to move towards, at least that's what it's suggesting, uh, move towards a more market-driven uh, uh, forex market, you know, based on that willing buyer, willing seller. Uh, is that why we're still seeing, that's one, two, is, all, is that why we're still seeing the Naira at elevated levels? I'm talking about, you know, still trading, the other day we saw it at 1.5, uh, just over 8,500, but it's come down to somewhere uh, above 1,400. Is that why we're still seeing uh, that at the Naira still at elevated levels uh, because 
you know, when it comes right down yes, to uh, it, it's still a function of supply and demand. Yeah. You're right, Esther, uh, because uh, what the central bank uh, did initially was to ensure that um, uh, the apex bank is, uh, isn't gagging the, the FX market. Uh, they actually want the market to trade freely uh, because in a situation where uh, you limit the uh, trading back of the market, one way or the other, you're already seeing, oh, this market can't trade beyond or below this level. So it's a way of gagging markets, and I think uh, that's what the central bank is going to do. And um, uh, one good thing about it is that um, we'll be seeing this back-to-back -back, um, uh, specular from central bank around FX to shaping the FX market. And uh, the last one, which was about uh, removing the cap, was a very great one because it simply means that uh, you can put uh, whatever range and you can trade uh, whatever range. And uh, uh, like I said earlier on, uh, the only thing that's still lacking in the market is liquidity. And one of the reasons why you still see people are still quoting as high as a thousand five hundred and above was because uh, there's no limit to uh, rates that you can actually quote on the market. And when there's demand and the, there isn't supply in the market, you tend to see uh, people demanding to will likely want to buy from from that elevated levels. And that's what we've been seeing in the past days. Uh, but with the emergence of uh, central bank back into the market after close to about five months of period, uh, I think it's a good news to the market because it simply means that. Uh, people can actually buy directly from banks uh, based on the allocation from the central bank. So I think in the matter of time, I uh, will tend to see market trade uh, more reasonably and also trade in a way that um, it will be in tandem with uh, some of those policies. Uh, and I, I'm very sure uh, international monetary organizations like IMF, World Bank, they're actually excited uh, with some of this reform, knowing fully well that uh, this will further open up our markets and also attract uh, foreign inflows to the markets. I wanted to ask, I'm just curious, have we been here before where uh, we had an absolutely uh, market-driven uh, forex system where it was just based on, like the CBN has been pushing, a willing buyer, willing seller, just seeing if we can benefit from uh, history here? No, we, we've not been here before because uh, uh, what we used to know was uh, something we call the WDAS, uh, which is the wholesale dot auction system. And at the time, the central bank will invest to uh, something we call RDAS, which is the retail dot auction system. And this system is where people actually buy uh, from central bank uh, bank who, who actually um, sum up all the demand from their customer and take it to the central bank uh, to actually get uh, filled. And also, when they were talking about the retail dot auction system, it simply means that when you are taking uh, the, the request to the bank, you must take it based on your customer name and not the name of the bank. And that was at the time when we were getting to see paucity of FX supply. And the central bank was trying to monitor uh, who gets allocation and who, who, who has a genuine uh, need for FX. Uh, but currently, I, I think uh, this is just a first step uh, towards the right direction. What the central bank was trying to do currently is trying to do currently is to ensure that uh, market uh, uh, sanity of the market returns, uh, because for a long time uh, we've been seeing a lot of things happening in the market that is, in, that is not the norm. So what the central bank is trying to do first is, uh, firstly, let us stop the market issues. Let us ensure that the market is sane. Let us ensure that our market can attract foreign investments. And we will we'll surely get to a level where we will likely to reverse back to more like a managed floating system. Uh, because I don't think the central bank will perpetually float uh, at the market like this. Uh, so it simply means that just like what we saw yesterday, uh, central bank will come into the market uh, intermittently to actually uh, meet people's demand in the market. So it means that when Naira is overly um, overpriced, uh, the central bank will come to the market and buy dollars from banks and give them Naira. And uh, when they know that the, the Naira is overly uh, um, underpriced, they will come to the market and uh, sell dollars to the market and buy Naira uh, from banks. So, so right. that's the form of way to actually manage uh, the, the system. Right. Now, final note on the Naira. Does this mean, I mean, that being said, can businesses now plan, those businesses uh, that are exposed to dollars, or foreign exchange, can they now plan, knowing that there's some, perhaps we're closer now to, uh, a price discovery in terms of what the true value of the Naira is? Yes, I, I think uh, we're getting closer to um, where where they can be more comfortable with. Uh, a lot, for a long time, one of the reasons why most of these businesses found themselves in this level was that um, 
they were unable to even get supply, even at that part of those levels. Uh, but now, at 1,500 uh, for a start, um, I'm sure they will get ample supplies, even from the central bank uh, at this level. Uh, but we, I feel that um, this will also just be for a matter of time, because I expect markets to now trade downward from here. Because it simply means that when central bank comes to the market regularly to sell FX to the market, it gets to a level that banks will not be quoting a 1,500 level to buy from the from central bank. Uh, because at that particular point in time, most of the needs of their customer have been, have been met, and nobody wants to hold uh, uh, FX uh, dollar at 1,500. Knowing pretty well that if supply continues in this dimension, there's every tendency that we can go uh, down to the lower part of the thousand uh, and uh, nobody wants to take effect at that particular point in time. So we'll start, start seeing uh, banks putting a uh, thousand two hundred, a thousand two fifty uh, to the central bank to buy from the central bank, and this will also do tail uh, to what is actually happening in the parliament. Right. Uh, I wanted to just quickly get before I let you go, uh, just your thoughts on this story that we're looking at today: uh, it's a trade and investment, a Nigeria and the UK partnering. Uh, to boost uh, economic ties. On Tuesday, uh, Nigeria and the United Kingdom uh, signed an upgraded trade and investment partnership aimed at enhancing uh, economic ties between both countries. Now, the agreement signed in Abuja by Kemi uh, Badinok, Sec Secretary of State for Business and Trade, and Doris Nkiruka Uzoka, Anita, Nigeria's trade minister, uh, it marks the first of its kind between the UK and um, an African nation, as a matter of fact. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I, I think it's, it's a great one, uh, uh, but if you look at what has been happening in the, in the recent past, uh, we'll be seeing a lot of con countries actually coming to, into the African continent, so actually partner with African countries. Uh, you think country like the U.S., just um, 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 some, some weeks ago, um, U.S. representative was in the country also to actually um, speak around these same uh, trade agreements. And also, in the past, we've seen Russia coming into the African continent to actually partner with all of the African countries. And uh, we know um, China to, have, to always have a presence in the African continent. We also have France. So it simply means that a lot of these developments are seeing values in African countries. And they are currently uh, aggressively coming to Africa uh, to actually partner with, the, with African countries around them, uh, actually conducting these um, this untapped um, resources into uh, more like a productive one. And that's one of the reasons why um, uh, the UK uh, representative was in the country yesterday to talk about trade, talk about education, talk about infrastructure, talk about energy, uh, to talk about ways to actually improve job creation in, in the in Nigeria space. And I think it, it's a great one. And that just this is just like, uh, for me, more like the offshoot from um, the request of the president at the UN General Assembly, where he mentioned that African countries are not beggars. Uh, we have resources, we have uh, natural resources, we have human resources. We just need people to partner with us with their finances as uh, so as to take African countries to the level at which uh, most of these developments are, are actually operating. And I guess this is exactly what's happening now. All right, thank you so much, Dipo, for talking to us today. We appreciate your time on the show. That was Dipo Ajayi, uh, head of FX at Chapel Hill Denim, looking at, uh, of course, the uh, update in Nigeria's FX reforms and this latest uh, upgraded uh, part, trade and investment partnership between the Nigeria and the UK. We'll take a quick break and we'll be right back with our international headlines. Join us again. Welcome back. International headlines now. According to the Office for National Statistics, British consumer price inflation unexpectedly held steady at an annual rate of 4% in January this year. This stability, unchanged from December last year, comes as a positive for the Bank of England, countering economists' projections of a rise to 4.2%. But despite this, inflation is anticipated to decrease in the coming months. Core inflation, excluding volatile items like food and energy, remained at 5.1%. However, services inflation, a key gauge of domestic price pressure for the Bank of England, edged up to 6.5% from December's 6.4%. The Bank of England is concerned about rapid wage growth in the services sector, potentially adding further inflationary pressure. Finance Minister Jared May Hunt expressed confidence in the plan to lower inflation, citing progress from 11% and anticipating a decline to around 2%. 
Elsewhere, Asian shares extended their decline today as global investors adjusted their expectations for the pace and scale of rate cuts by the Federal Reserve. This shift in rate expectations followed a higher than expected U.S. inflation data with the Consumer Price Index rising 3.1% annually. Futures now indicate around 90 basis points of easing price in, in for the Fed this year, down from 110 basis points prior to the data release. The pressure on global stocks, which had rallied on expectations of a rate cut, continued. Asian Pacific shares fell 0.3%, while the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq futures showed slight gains. The dollar and treasury yields rose as well. The prospect of higher rates pushed the benchmark 10-year treasury yield to a two-month high. And at the commodities market, OPEC reaffirmed its optimistic outlook for global oil demand growth in 2024 and 2025, while also raising its economic growth forecast for both years. The organization stated that it expects world oil demand to increase by 2.25 million barrels per day in 2024 and by 1.85 million barrels per day next year. Now, these forecasts remain unchanged from the previous month. The organization raised its economic growth forecast for 2024 and 2025 by 0 0.1 percentage points. Oil prices have been boosted by Middle East conflict and supply disruptions, although concerns about high interest rates have weighed on the market. OPEC and the IEA have had differing views on long-term demand and the need for investment in new supply. Despite these differences, OPEC maintains a robust outlook for long-term oil demand. OPEC and a wider OPEC Plus alliance have implemented output cuts to support the market with the latest round of voluntary cuts reducing OPEC oil production to 26.34 million barrels per day in January. Those are top business headlines internationally. We'll take a quick break and I'll be right back with our second conversation. Join us again. Welcome back. A review report published in 2023 found that South Africa's available labor supply does not match demand from companies which are essentially looking to employ management level personnel, professionals, engineers, technicians, science and math educators, as well as IT experts. According to the report, in the short term, many of these high level skills must be sourced internationally. In response to this, the government is amending its visa system to attract foreign talent across critical sectors. But joining me from Halteng, South Africa, to unpack the new regulations is Patrick Deal, a lawyer at Deal Attorneys. Thank you, Patrick, for joining us today. No, it's my pleasure. Good to be with you. Before we go into those, um, the amendments or the reforms to the visa system, I just wanted to get, uh, I wanted to get a sense of uh, the, the talent gap, uh, the scale of it uh, in South Africa, and why it's become important at this point to do something about it. First of all, the gap is very large, um, and it's extremely important to, to close the gap. Essentially what's happened is that South Africa, certain elements of the South African economy and economy and industry have been growing, um, sort of sophisticated uh, businesses like IT, logistics, and uh, those types of industries that would, which require higher skills higher skills, well, higher skills, highly skilled people, IT people, engineers, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, there has been a lag in attracting people because the, re the, the visa regulations have been complicated. They have been burdensome, take a long time to process. And uh, it has um, basically really created blockages for employers, companies, businesses, who want to advance their businesses to attract the right skills. So a, a, a considerable gap, uh, probably running into hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions, um, in the available skills. And the skills available in South Africa are not uh, sufficiently skilled and in numbers to be able to satisfy the demand. So the point of this thing is to close the gap as fast as possible. Well, if you could just give us a sense of, of what is changing, uh, you've given us, a, a, I suppose, a broad view of uh, the difficulties in the visa system, but help us understand what is changing, what is new, and uh, perhaps if there are also timelines to this. 
Yeah. Um, first of all, there's a new set of amendments on time wise, uh, timelines wise, and it's up for public comment. It changes to the visa regulations. Uh, the comments close on the 29th of March. And hopefully during the course of this year, this will be fast tracked through Parliament. So that's insofar as the timeline is concerned. Insofar as what the big idea is concerned, what uh, the, um, the regulations aim to do is to uh, provide two main things, really. One thing is the notion of uh, a, a visa for people who want to work in South Africa, basically foreign people who want to work in South Africa, um, to choose it as a lifestyle and uh, be paid by and employed by companies overseas. And this is in response to great demand for business processing in, in located in South Africa because of its infrastructure availability and um, its relatively low costs. So the what they call the digital visa or digital nomads, they even call them, people who would want to work in South Africa, choose it as a lifestyle and work for countries in Europe, China, wherever. And uh, they can get a special visa to work here. And this is reserved for the higher end. These are people who earn more than a million rand a year, which is more than, say, I think in the area of more than 52, 53,000 US dollars a year. And they can get a visa to work in South Africa to... Um, you know, because it's their choice and they can live there and, and work for a foreign company. So the, the digital nomad, nomad is the first sort of major change uh, to create uh, people, you know, an agile environment to attract these people. The second significant change is what they uh, are introducing is the idea of what they call a trusted employer scheme. And a trusted employer scheme is those for foreign companies you know, like Amazon, uh, others, big car manufacturers and so on, who, are, who operate in South Africa, to be pre-assessed uh, for their needs of uh, employing people to work in South Africa in jobs that they have uh, available for skilled people in South Africa. And they would, uh, there would be a point system which would uh, apply to them. And the point system would rate them or assess them in advance as uh, to qualify as trusted, trusted employers. And if they are registered as trusted employers, the process um, of getting people into the future is fast-tracked much, much quicker than it is if you have to get individual visas for each person. So if, if a big uh, IT company wants to employ in South Africa and it's already been vetted and assessed, right. uh, then they can, you know, apply very quickly to get people into the country. And there are a number of criteria that they'll be, they'll be rated on. Right. As far as implementation goes, what will be key in ensuring uh, that this is successful? Well, it, it is that um, the, the, the idea is to stick to the, the idea of the point system. The idea of the point system is to try and create more transparency. And the more transparency you create, the less disputes uh, there are likely to, to happen. And the less disputes there are, uh, because people can visibly see why this com company has been uh, re registered as a trusted employer, why this person has uh, qualified as a digital nomad. All of the information is there, and the less disputes uh, about it. And so I, I think that that might speed up the process and the delays. But also because the guidelines are much clearer in the past and because the intention behind it uh, seems to be to want to fast track it, then it would be speedier and less burdensome, less bureaucratic than it has been uh, in, in the past. And, and hopefully, you know, all of the, the, the painful processes of trying to get visas uh, will be made easier so that it's easier for investments, individuals to come and work here, Right. as uh, nomads and for companies in advance to want to invest because it's not a big hassle to get skilled people here because they're not available here, but they can bring them in from wherever. Right. I know you, you mentioned earlier that this is for uh, 
not just skilled uh, professionals, but highly skilled uh, professionals. But just to take you quickly back to that report uh, in 2023, it also mentions uh, gaps in uh, technicians, science, and math educators. I, I just, I'm just wondering, how do South Africans feel about this? Because the country does have a high uh, unemployment, uh, I mean, high unemployment levels, both youth unemployment and you know, just broad uh, unemployment. And just to get your thoughts on that, you know, how South Africans feel about this, we know that there have been cases in the past where you know, there have been uh, skirmishes, uh, unrest, et cetera. You know, the locals are complaining about foreigners coming into the country to take uh, jobs that they believe belong to them. Uh, so this is perhaps going to be a, a balancing act for the government. Uh, but what are, your thoughts, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, you, I think you nailed it there when you said it's a balancing act. You're perfectly right on that. It's an extremely sensitive uh, point in this country, and understandably. And, you know, I, I think somehow, um, you know, the transparency that I've talked about is one thing. But secondly, that, um, you know, the, the, the whole idea of this is that uh, it's been seen almost, if you like, as a bridging arrangement until we can develop the skills up to those uh, who we have to import now and we can get them from homegrown sources. So it, it might be a bridging uh, arrangement for the next five or 10 years. And for so long as there is hope that those in South Africa who, who, who don't qualify for these skills, who don't have technical skills um, or professional skills that uh, are, are desperately needed, they don't have them now, at least they have the chance of getting them in the next five years and uh, or the, whatever period of time available in technical co colleges and programs that are available in South Africa and which they can use. That might help to take some of the pressure off, some of the, um, you know, the sense of being left out and left behind off, it's provided they're in the pipeline and know that this arrangement may not be a permanent one, that it'll be slowly phased out as soon as we get educated, well, not educated, skilled people coming through the system that are able to be drawn from the local employment market rather than having to import them. So over time, I think that uh, that will happen and that as long as people know that the message gets through, we're not ignoring you. This is in a way a temporary arrangement and we're going to help you to get up to the standard and to give you hope to give you the idea of a vision that you can be employed and that you will get the skills to be so employed. Are there measuring uh, measurement uh, tools? Uh, what I'm getting at is, at what point will the government know that uh, you know, it has it's perhaps gotten uh, an, a significant amount of talent to the country? Because you know, listening to President Ramaph Ramaphosa and some uh, remarks uh, in the not too distant past when he was talking about uh, making amendments to the visa system where he said an efficient and agile uh, visa re uh, regime is key to attracting business investments. Uh, he did say that uh, this is key to boosting the economy. He's hoping that this will bring in more investments and also boost the economy. So is there sort of a measuring process uh, where the country will know that, okay, at this point, we do have enough of the skills that we need, et cetera? Or is this, you think that this is something that's going to take years and years? I think it will take years and years. But I do think that these things are measurable. I think we've got very strong uh, measurement systems, statistical data uh, about what's happening in various sectors within the um, country, within, you know, within the, the, the economy. We have a very strong um, department of statistics that measures everything. You know? and, and so they report year on year what... Uh, you know, on, on employment levels and which industries are, are growing, which ones are shrinking, where future needs are going to be. And it forms a basis to be able to predict uh, where where we're going in certain industries, where the skills levels, um, you know, are, are falling behind, where then future needs will be as well. So we have very strong data that is, is available in the country to help guide, uh, to measure... Right where we are um, as we go along. So it's very, it's available. Now on the other side of the coin to this is talent also leaving uh, South Africa. We've seen that happen or continue, continue to happen across the continent. Nigeria is a classical example. 
Uh, is this something the government is also looking at to ensure that as they're trying to attract more talent in, are they also tracking the number of talent that's also leaving the country? To my knowledge, it hasn't been expressed uh, in, in those terms uh, that, uh, you know, there is sort of, you know, great incentives for, for people to want to emigrate uh, from, from South Africa to other countries. But I, I, I suspect that the attention will turn to doing exactly that, to keep the talent in, because it's one thing to try and attract skills into the country. It's another, you know, to lose skills going out. And somehow, if you can keep the skills in here, you don't have to bring in as many, obviously, uh, into the country. And so, you know, the, the idea of trying to incentivize skilled South Africans, skilled technical people, to stay rather than go, I think has been not as emphasized as strongly as it should be, I think, and that there could be more attention paid to that to, to sort of uh, stop the outflow of skills, to be able to modify the, the need for the inflow of skills coming in, most certainly. I think particularly, too, this re relates to, uh, applies to younger South Africans. Um, who, you know, who finished university. There's so many graduates who are stuck in this sort of no man's land where they've got a qualification, a technical qualification or a professional qualification, um, and they, but they can't get a job because they haven't got the experience and they get stuck in this experience gap. And what many of them do is that uh, to solve this dilemma, um, you know, they either say, well, look, I've got the experience, but I can't get a job because there are various regulations, um, there are various criteria for selecting people for jobs and so on, that blocks them or prevents them from getting a job. So they go away to get the experience. And once they experience, they get the experience, then they're more likely to get a job, you know, when they come back. So that, that sort of in scary, the, the, the experience conundrum, um, it does create a, uh, a bit of a problem. Right. Um, and encourages people to go. So perhaps, and now there has been talk actually about trying to um, place, the government has been talking about paying less, less attention on experience on, uh, of, you know, as a criteria to give youngsters, to give people coming into the system right. who are qualified the experience. So I think that that will be a focus in the future, which would try to stop this problem a little bit anyway. Right. Patrick, I must thank you for your time today. Thank you for talking to us, giving us a a better sense of these new uh, amendments to South Africa's visas uh, system to attract uh, foreign talent into the country. That was Patrick Deal, lawyer at Deal Attorneys. Well, that's it My on pleasure. Business Edge for today. Remember, we're on social media. We're at News Central. From the team and I, it's bye for now.